In the early hours of Sunday, July the 5th, 2009, our son Adam was returning home with friends after a night out in Blackburn when he was attacked by a 16-year-old youth. He was knocked to the ground by a single punch and died later that day from his injuries. I'd like to tell you the story of that tragic night and its consequences about the senseless and avoidable behaviour that led to that fatal punch and the impact of Adam's death on the lives of so many people. Adam had only recently returned to Blackburn after more than four years away and the whole point of his night out was to meet up in town with lots of his old friends. Everyone who met him says that he was very happy and really enjoying his night. He didn't drink too much. He wanted to make the most of his time with his friends. And hospital tests later showed that at the end of the evening, he was below the legal limit for driving. His friend Rachel tells how the evening began. The night started really well. We had gone out with friends and met up with Adam, who we hadn't seen for ages. He walked up behind me and tapped me on both shoulders to get my attention. I turned round and we hugged each other and I kissed his cheek. At about 3am we went outside where we sat on the benches. Adam was crouched on one knee as there was nowhere to sit. I stood next to him and nudged him gently with my knee to make him fall over. I sat down next to him and we chatted. I noticed the socks he was wearing. They were brown with diamonds on. I said they looked like Dad's socks and Adam laughed. Some of us wanted to get something to eat before we went to Adam's. I said goodbye and I gave him a quick hug before I left him. After they'd gone, Adam, Carl and Chris were sitting on a stone bench. There were quite a few people milling about. One group included a 16-year-old boy, two 19-year-olds and their two teenage girlfriends. One of the girls came across and sat on the bench behind Carl. He turned round to see who it was and started talking to her. Immediately, the 16-year-old began shouting, Shut up! Shut up! Carl and Chris responded to this and insults were traded until eventually there was an offer of a fight. Carl at first was ready to accept, but was soon persuaded by Chris and Adam that it wasn't worth it. The three of them walked away to meet Rachel, Joss and Scott coming back. They were followed by taunts and jeers from the teenagers. The incident seemed to be over, but unfortunately, when the other group set off soon afterwards, they too went in the same direction. When they caught up with them, the 16-year-old, egged on by his friends, thought it would be funny to run across the road and throw a large flower head at Carl. Obviously, it wasn't meant to injure, but to provoke a reaction. Unfortunately, Carl did react by spitting towards the boy's retreating back. The two 19-year-olds then came running across and one of them attacked Carl. Adam was standing between the scuffle and the 16-year-old who started to come back towards it and Adam obviously thought he was intending to join in and the CCTV cameras show him shepherding the boy away from the fight with his arms outstretched in an unaggressive manner. Two council workers waiting in their van describe what happened next. The boy was walking towards them. Adam was with him and had both his arms down by his side. He was talking to the boy and both witnesses said it seemed like Adam was trying to calm him down. Adam didn't seem to realise how drunk the boy was or how angry he was becoming and suddenly the boy swung round and threw a heavy punch at Adam's face. Unable to protect himself when he fell, his head hit the ground first. As Adam lay there on the ground, one of the girls shouted, Good punch. Two passers-by intervened at this time and the three teenagers ran off. Rachel describes what happened next. Scott got a phone call from Chris saying Adam was on the floor. 
We thought Adam would have just been playing around as he usually did, so we weren't too worried. As we got near, we could see people stood around looking shocked, and I saw someone lying on the floor. Carl had blood all over his face, and Chrissy's shirt was covered with blood. I rushed over to Adam. I could only tell it was him because I saw his socks. I knelt down next to his head and stroked his hair. I kept talking to him and told him it was going to be all right. He was breathing heavily and his eyes were open. Blood was coming from his mouth. Then the ambulance came. I could tell by the paramedic's face that it wasn't good. They didn't rush. They just said he was very poorly. The next morning, the 16-year-old was at home logged on to his Facebook page. Unaware of the terrible injuries he'd caused, he was still very pleased with himself and the punch he'd thrown. He posted the word timber, celebrating the fact that Adam had gone down like a fallen tree. Later in the day, he went to the police and confessed to hitting Adam. Unfortunately, he also claimed to have acted in self-defence. Eight months later, it was very difficult for us to sit in court and listen as Adam was described as a threatening bully. Anyone who knew Adam knew that this was impossible. He was a friendly, gentle young man who never threatened anyone in his life. Fortunately, the jury didn't believe the boy's story either and he was found guilty of manslaughter and sentenced to four years in prison. For us, the nightmare began with the phone ringing in our hotel apartment in Malta. Adam had taken us to the airport late on in Saturday afternoon and returned to Blackburn for his night out. As we said goodbye and gave him a big hug, little did we think that it would be the last time we would see him alive. The phone call was from our youngest son, Jamie. He just said, Mum, it's Adam. He's been attacked and it's really bad. Then the doctor came on the phone and explained that Adam had serious brain injuries. He just said, get back as soon as you can. We flew straight back to Manchester and arrived at the hospital around lunchtime. We went straight down to the critical care unit where Adam was being kept alive by the machines. He looked so normal, a natural colour in his cheeks. He was warm to the touch and his soft brown hair flopped over his forehead. It seemed like he was just sleeping and might wake up at any moment. At 2.29, the doctor told us that there was no sign of any brain activity and that Adam was clinically dead. Everyone was in a state of shock. The hospital staff were fantastic and they allowed everyone to go in to say their last goodbyes. It's difficult to describe how we felt at that moment, but we did realise that we were in a very dark place and that we had to try to find any positives we could to help us deal with a very grim situation. The first opportunity came when we spoke to the organ transplant team as Adam was a registered donor. I remembered that when Adam was filling in his driving license application a few years ago, he'd no hesitation in putting his name down. So a very difficult decision was made much easier because we knew what Adam wanted. It was the first positive step for us to take. Adam could still help others even after his death. That night, five people received life-changing transplants. Over the next few days, the idea for the Consequences campaign began to take shape. We wanted to use Adam's story to help young people to think about attitudes to alcohol and violence. Adam had lost his life to a single blow a stupid, senseless, reckless act of unprovoked and drunken violence. It would be a fitting tribute to Adam's memory and a positive way for us to channel our grief and anger. So we set up the charity 
Every action has consequences to help us get our message across. On a more personal level, the full awfulness of what had happened began to sink in. We would never ever see Adam again, yet we could feel his presence all over the house. In his room was the football kit he'd been wearing on the Saturday afternoon for a practice match before taking us to the airport, still smelling of him. His car was parked at the back and I half expected any moment to see him come smiling up the path to the back door. It was so difficult to accept the finality of Adam's death and not just for us, his family, but also his many friends. Rachel describes how she and Joss felt about the loss of their friend. In the weeks and months after that night, we couldn't eat or sleep. When I did sleep, I had vivid nightmares about what I saw, living it again and again. The doctor prescribed me with sleeping pills and suggested counselling. We blamed ourselves, thinking we should have looked after him. We became protective of each other and our families, scared of losing the ones we love. We struggled to understand why this had to happen to Adam. We still worry when we go out at night, conscious of our surroundings and the people around us. We will never forget that night. Finally, something about Adam podged to his friends and the kind of person he was. The first thing I'd like to say is simply that he was a good man and he lived a good life. Those who knew him would agree that he was gentle, kind, loving, affectionate, reliable, funny and always friendly. He was very special, not just for us, but also for his friends. It's still hard to comprehend how someone as nice as Adam could have been taken away from us like that. He seemed so unfair. He never harmed anyone or had a bad word to say about anybody. He was always cheeky and happy. If you weren't feeling too great, he'd do daft things just to make you laugh, just so you'd feel better. He would have helped anyone in any way he could. He always put others before himself. Joss misses him so much. We all do. I probably don't need to say this, but I'm really proud of my son Adam and the way he lived his life. More than that, I feel privileged to have known him and shared his life for nearly 25 years. Of course I miss him. I miss him more than I can say. But then, as Rachel says, we all do. We all try to balance our grief and sense of loss with precious memories of him and the things we did together. In that sense, he's still with us.